Master Next Generation NCLEX question live day three. If you've missed the previous two days, you need to go back in our YouTube channel, find the live where we discuss a very, very interesting question on GERD. We also talked a little bit about cardiac complications. We even saw an electrocardiogram strip and we practiced an EKG style of question. So if you haven't seen those two days, go back and find it in our YouTube channel. So let's go straight to today's scenario. So read with me. And as you read with, with me, start thinking of what is going on here. The nurse is caring for a 56 year old client in the emergency department. So I always like to, to underline some keywords. Our patient is 56 year old, not too old or young. I should say <laughs> the client reports something sudden. The word sudden means that this is a uh, new, this is something that appear rapidly drastically it says that it's not only sudden but also is severe so this keyword here sudden and severe tells us that we're dealing with a possible emergency we kept we keep reading it says the sudden and severe tearing sensation with anterior chest, back, and shoulder pain rated 10 on the scale of 0 to 10. So this is another confirmation that the patient is going through a severe condition. This is an emergency. Now, part of the description, I want you to pay attention to this word. The description of the type of painful sensation on the chest tearing sensation that is severe with a pain of 10 on the scale of 0 to 10 what are you starting to think of so i want you to comment in the comment section some of your ideas what, what do you think what could be going on here of course, there's not a whole lot of information yet at this point of the, of the paragraph, but we're going to continue reading, but start thinking of what, what you think is going on. The client is diaphoretic and DC as well. Long sounds are clear to auscultation. So why are they telling us about lung sounds that are clear to auscultation. I think that they're probably describing this here. So you can start thinking that probably the problem is not respiratory. There's some other kind of problem going on here. A murmur is heard on the external border. So murmur, external border. Hmm. This is interesting, confirms that this is probably a cardiac problem. Peripheral pulses are weak. The client has hypertension that it is not well controlled and atherosclerosis. So we got a little bit of, of history here, background, and they're giving us on this scenario the vital signs. When we look at the vital signs, the temperature is okay. So no fever, no infectious process. The pulse is a little bit high, tachycardia. Remember above 100 is tachycardia for an adult. The respiratory rate is also a little bit high. Supposed to be from 12 to 20. And now we see some interesting information that can start directing your thought process to a more specific heart condition. When we look at the blood pressure, the blood pressure is 176 over 98. 
176 systolic, 98 diastolic in the right arm. But if we notice on the left arm, there is a difference in the blood pressure. The blood pressure on the left arm is 150 over 91. So the blood pressure was taken on the right arm, 176 over 98. The blood pressure was taken on the left arm and is 150 over 98. What is going on? That the systolic pressure drastically is lower on the left arm in comparison to the right arm. So now I start thinking a little bit more uh, focus on what what type of cardiac problem do you think can cause this? Because I look at the, at the chat, the comment section, and I see some of you described maybe a myocardial infarction, maybe angina pectoris. Okay, very good. With this new information, do you think of anything else? Anything else other than MI, other than angina? What else comes to mind? The SpO2, oxygen saturation, is 93% on room air. So once again, probably not a respiratory problem going on here. So I'll, I'll let you thinking. Let's continue with the other information that we have in this scenario. Laboratory test was conducted and chest x-ray and a 12 lead EKG was completed. In the laboratory test, we see that the troponin were <laughs> negative. The range is less than 0.1 micrograms per liter, but it was completely negative 0.0, both troponin T and troponin 1. Hmm. So some of you that were thinking of myocardial infarction, as you see these troponin levels, and you look at the 12 lead EKG, it's telling you that the 12 lead EKG, 12 lead EKG is sinus tachycardia without X ST segment elevation or depression. So you gotta say, hmm. So we do have chest pain of a tearing description, tearing characteristics. Troponins are negative. Sinus tachycardia without ST segment elevation or depression. So you're probably not thinking of myocardial infarction anymore because the scenario is not inclining in that direction. But when we look at the chest x-ray, it says that there is widening of the mediastinum. What does that tell you? Why widening of the mediastinum, everything else negative, and a blood pressure that it is different in the right arm in comparison to the left arm, and at the same time, the patient described the pain, severe, a tearing sensation, and at auscultation, a murmur is heard on the external border. By making a summary of everything that I'm telling you, you should start thinking of a very specific cardiac problem. If you are not thinking of anything particular yet, maybe watching the question will give you a better idea. So you need to differentiate between four potential conditions. Pericarditis, aortic decession, pulmonary embolism, or acute myocardial infarction. Well, based on what I've said so far, I know that you're probably not going to pick any more acute myocardial infarction. You see, I talk too much sometimes. I tell you too much. 
I analyze it too deep and then you, you start deducting some of the answers. But it's okay. We're learning. It's not the NCLEX. So what do you think now? If you were to pick an answer in this bow tie, remember this is a bow tie style of question, what do you think is the potential condition? Would you select pericarditis, aortic dissection, pulmonary embolism, or acute myocardial infarction? Let's see. Let me see your answers in the comment section. Remember, always comment in the comment section. And remember, if you're liking these lives, make sure you hit the like button, you subscribe to our channel, and share this video with everybody else. Enjoy the lives. I'm not here often. I every once in a while I disappear. I get too busy and I don't do it, but I'm trying to make a commitment to myself and you to come back. And often during this live transact this live um, YouTube lives, because I know that you guys like it, you learn, and even the students that are in our programs, they even like when I interact here on YouTube. All right, I see heart failure. Well, heart failure is not one of the options. So we cannot put heart failure. Aortic decession, okay. Pericarditis, pericarditis, pericarditis. Wow, I see the, the most frequent answer is pericarditis. Pericarditis. Hmm. Okay. Well, stick to your answer. Whatever you think your answer is, select it. And now let's look at the action to take. Actions to take. Pick a condition and now select two answers on actions to take that for you is the correct answer. In other words, based on the client scenario, laboratory values, x-ray, vitals, patient description, select two actions that you think will help the patient. Administer IV opioids, administer IV heparin, administer IV beta blocker, position the client upright leaning forward, so reposition the patient, Prepare the client for percutaneous coronary angiography. And then identify two parameters that you would like to monitor. Heart sounds, the pulse pressure, the activated PTT levels, chest pain on inspiration, and hematoma near the femoral artery. I want to look at your answers before I tell you the final answer. Adamasi, I love it so much. Thank you, Adamasi. I appreciate it. I love to see that my students enjoy what I'm doing. Aortic uh, decession, pericarditis, prepare for a percutaneous coronary angiography. Okay. Position the client to administer a beta blocker. Okay, so the two answers you selected was position the client upright and leaning forward and the administration of beta blocker. I see. Uh, Angel, uh, prepare for a P, uh, percutaneous coronary angiography and also administer opioids. Okay. All right, are you ready for the answer? So if you're ready for the answer, comment. Yes, ready for the answer. And let's get ready to improve. So what I like to use, I like to use the process of elimination, okay? I like to try to identify what I don't think the patient has. 
as I told you, I don't think I don't think acute myocardial infarction is the answer. Why not? Why I don't think the acute MI is the answer? Well, the troponin levels were negative. The 12 lead EKG was sinus tachycardia. There was no ST segment elevation or depression or any other manifestations on the EKG indicating a myocardial infarction. So I don't think acute myocardial infarction is the answer. So I'm left with pericarditis, aortic dissection, and pulmonary embolism. Let's try to recall the description for the pain in pericarditis. Inflammation of the pericardium. So the description for pericarditis will be more of a pleuritic chest pain that worsens on inspiration. Okay? So that is key for pericarditis. Pleuritic chest pain worsening on inspiration with a pericardial friction rub heard at auscultation independent of respiratory or independent of the respiration. Was that described on this scenario? That type of pain was not described in the scenario. So pericarditis, probably not the answer. Not the answer. Okay? The other thing that we usually tend to see is an ST segment changes to the ST segment. And there was no information of changes to the ST segment. So another reason to eliminate pericarditis. So now I am left with aortic decession and pulmonary embolism. Okay? So what type of pain pulmonary embolism cause? It will cause a sudden pleuritic chest pain, dyspnea, and hypoxemia. Was there any indication of this on the stem of the question? The type of pain for PE could be usually intermittent, not continue, continuous pain, as it was described in the stem of the question. So pulmonary embolism should not be the answer. The correct answer is aortic dissection. How do we know is aortic dissection? Well, everything in the case describe this problem. The type of pain for aortic dissection is severe, sharp, abrupt, either chest or back pain, and it is described as the tearing characteristic in the pain. So that is characteristic of aortic dissection. But also, another key factor is that aortic dissection also affects peripheral pulses. Depending on the type of the aortic dissection, the pulses are going to be affected differently. I, I will explain that in a little bit. But we definitely see a change in the peripheral pulses and also the blood pressure. We're going to see a change in blood pressure where the blood pressure, the systolic blood pressure is going to be higher in one arm than the other, specifically the systolic blood pressure because the systolic blood pressure is the more, most indicative for volume. And there is a problem with volume here because of the decession. 
So everything in the scenario points towards an aortic decession. Okay? So an aortic decession is a tear in the inner lining of the aorta. Basically, the problem there is that the blood is going to collect between the layers of the arterial wall. It creates a false lumen and weakens the aortic wall. I'm going to show you a picture so you can understand a little bit, a little bit better. So if the problem is aortic dissection, what actions am I going to take? I can also use the process of elimination here because what you're going to see is that they're going to put actions that deals with pericarditis. They're going to put actions that deal also with pulmonary embolism. And they're going to put actions that deals with acute myocardial infarction. So if I already eliminated pericarditis, pulmonary embolism, and acute myocardial infarction, I can eliminate some of the actions to take that relate to those conditions. For example, the administration of IV heparin. Answer number two, this one. IV heparin. What do you think that relates more to? IV heparin. Does that relate more to pericarditis, aortic decession, pulmonary embolism, or acute myocardial infarction? That relates more to a pulmonary embolism. The treatment includes anticoagulants and heparin is a medication that is administered so therefore I can eliminate that answer what is another answer that I can eliminate position the client upright and leaning forward well what when is that answer going to to make sense what do you think that answer relates to more comment comment in the comment set in the comment section correct pericarditis it would make more sense to pericarditis because changing the position is not going to do any for, for, for aortic dissection. But for pericarditis, yes, because leaning the patient forward, putting the patient upright, relieves a little bit the pressure on the inflamed pericardium. So this answer we can also eliminate. Prepare the client for percutaneous coronary angiography so that should be very easy what does that relate to acute myocardial infarction so i'm going to eliminate these answers and the correct answer is the administration of opioids and the administration of beta blocker that's going to be my answers for aortic dissection So the administration of IV opioids, well, that's going to help reduce the chest pain, but also helps to reduce the uh, myocardial oxygen demand. The administration of a beta blocker, it helps decrease blood pressure and heart rate. And why do I need to decrease blood pressure and heart rate in this scenario? Because what's the problem? What, what is your utmost complication? rupture of the aorta correct so there is risk for aortic rupture so administering a beta blocker helps to reduce the risk so so far my answers are aortic dissection administration of IV opioids and administration of IV beta blocker now, 
if these are my answers and the patient's condition is aortic dissection, what parameters am I going to monitor and which parameters I can eliminate because it pertains to the other answers? For example, activated PTT levels I can eliminate. What does that relate to? When do I need to monitor the PTT levels? Oh, if the patient has a pulmonary embolism and I administer IV heparin, I need to monitor PTT levels, but not for aortic dissection. So I can eliminate that one. Chest pain on inspiration. Well, we talked, we talked about this. We talked about which condition causes chest pain that increases with inspiration. We talked about it. I mentioned it. What do you think that relates to? Chest pain on inspiration. Pericarditis. Okay. So we're going to eliminate hematoma near the femoral artery. Well, that relates to a percutaneous coron coronary angiography. So I'm going to eliminate that one. My correct answer is heart sounds and pulse pressure. Now we have to think, does, does that make sense? Do I need to monitor for the pulse pressure? Why? Why do I need to monitor for the, for the blood pressure? For the pulse pressure, I'm sorry. So think about, if we said that we're going to see changes in the pulse, decrease peripheral pulses by monitoring the pulse pressure, okay, we are going to see if the pulse pressure, we maintain it within normal levels. That also helps reduce the risk of aortic rupture. So I definitely need to be monitoring for that. Correct. And then what do I need to monitor for hard sounds? How does that relate? because we got to look for signs and symptoms of cardiac tamponade, which is muffled heart sounds and also narrowed pulse pressure, because this is a complication of aortic dissection. Okay. Cardiac tamponade. So my final answers are, let me clear it up so you can see it a little bit better. Aortic dissection, my actions to take is the administration of IV opioids, administration of IV beta blocker, and the parameters to monitor heart sounds and pulse pressure. Now let's discuss a little bit more of what, what is aortic dissection. Okay. And I'm going to use this image from you world because they have the best photos. <laughs> they are, they are the best at that. So what is aortic dissection? Okay. Here we see the dissection. Here we see the intima, the wall, and we see the, the, the different wall and layers, the adventitia, the media, and the intima. And we're going to see that there is a tear causing the dissection. So an aortic dissection is a tear in the inner lining of the aorta. So this is what is going on. As I told you earlier, it creates a false lumen. Okay. So here you see the, this new lumen, this false lumen. But well, what is the problem with this, with this false lumen, it weakens the aortic wall, correct. 
okay now as you can see the aortic dissection there are two types type a and type b depending on the type of the aortic dissection the clinical manifestations may vary a little bit okay for type a is going to involve the ascending aorta for type b is going to be confined to the aorta distal to subclavian artery so it's going to be distal to the left subclavian artery and why is this important to me why is this important to learn about clinical manifestations let's talk about it type a type a aortic dissection basically basically it will produce an ineffective blood circulation and pulses and the pulses actually generally tend to be low in intensity in in all the extremities when it's type a in other words if we measure the pulses in the upper extremities and lower extremities in all the extremities is going to be affected it's going to be low low intensity but if the aortic dissection is of type b distal to the subclavian artery something very interesting is going to happen in type b there's going to be considerable significance in the intensity between the upper extremities and lower extremities it's going to be low in both upper and lower but when we compare the upper extremities and lower extremity is going to be stronger in the upper extremities in comparison to the lower extremities when we look at blood pressure in the type b aortic dissection we can also see that it produces more of a distribution of blood to the right side of the body than to the left so that is why we're going to see that difference in the blood pressure in the right arm in comparison to the left arm. When we see a, a significant difference in the blood pressure on the right versus the left arm, you're mainly thinking of aortic dissection of type B. Okay? So... This is a very interesting uh, scenario and a very interesting bow tie. You need to learn how to answer bow tie questions. That is why we are practicing here in this YouTube live and we will continue to practice in other, in other cases as well, in other lives. Okay. So if you are a nursing student and you're preparing for the NCLEX and you want a mentor to help you, we have a 15 weeks course. We meet once a week, usually on Thursdays, uh, from 6 p.m. to 10 p.m. live. And we cover 15 weeks of different topics, an uh, interesting topic for the NCLEX. We also include in this, uh, in this uh, master next generation NCLEX course, we include the UWorq Bank for access for six months. Okay? So if you're interested in joining that, I have uh, put the description in the description section, the link to our Master Next Generation NCLEX step-by-step -step course. You're more than welcome to look at it and contact the Academy if you're interested. And also, we also have the international membership. You can have access for just one month and cancel whenever you want, or you can have access for 90 days. The price is here. I've also uh, put the description in the description section, the link to join the Academy. Thank you for being here. Make sure you like this YouTube live. You subscribe to our YouTube channel so you don't miss any of the information. And I'll see you in the next, next live. Hopefully tomorrow, but as soon as I'm, I'm ready, I'll be live here. That's why I'm telling you, subscribe to the channel.
because I don't know exactly at what date, what time we're going to be doing because it's just going to be when I'm available. I'm very busy with all of our groups, but I also want to give something back to our YouTube community. Thank you very much. I hope all of you have have great success on your NCLEX preparation and that you can become a registered nurse in the U.S. Hopefully before the end of 2023, if not early beginning of 2024.